But let's talk about this North Korean problem. Is it a problem? This is something that the North Koreans like to do every time the U.S. and the South Koreans end up doing joint military operations. But they are talking about North Korea now preemptive nuclear strikes of justice. That's what they said, a quote, a preemptive nuclear strike of justice. And it does cause a wee bit of concern because for all of our dabblings in the Middle East, one of the things that we are not touching, not with a 10-foot pole, is North Korea. Now, the big reason for that, for anybody who, who doesn't know, is because of China. China still continues to support and protect North Korea. Had North Korea not been protected, we would have invaded that place like, uh, like Libya or Syria or anywhere else. It wouldn't have lasted long. But we all remember the Korean War, and China continues to support North Korea, even though it is a terribly destructive dictatorship that starves its own people and lies to them. There, was a, there have been great inside reports done on that part of the world on North Korea that, are, that really give you some insight. To give you an example, I think the average North Korean is two inches shorter and something like 20 pounds lighter than their South Korean counterpart. Prior to the war, it was all one place, which shows you just how destructive that totalitarianism has been. And it's, I, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm, I'm really shocked, again, that, Darren, who were, you were talking with somebody at the, uh, at the, at church on Sunday, and you were telling me he's from Brazil, mm -hmm. and he was saying, I don't know how people can't look at this and see what the problem. Tell tell the story to everybody. Well, basically, he was he was he came from Brazil somewhere about 20 years ago, back when they had their last uh, severe recession, and so he came to America looking for opportunity. And he said, "I just don't I don't understand Americans right now because they don't they don't see what's going on." He's like those of us who have experienced totalitarianism, those of us who have experienced socialism, and and. and to go farther, even communism, who have lived in that, don't understand the writing on the wall. They don't see what's coming. And he was like, I just can't wrap my head around it. They think everything's going to be free. Don't they understand what this leads to? And he told me stories about how his dad would put up uh, meat for the whole neighborhood to come around because people, even if they had money, they couldn't get, get access to bread or food. They couldn't buy it. There were no products there, just like we talked about in Venezuela. They put price controls, and now they have people that are trying to smuggle food inside the country. It's, you know, it's, it's, we, we've talked about it uh, almost, over and over again on the show, and, and we're going to continue to talk about it and, until things start to change. But one of the beautiful things is that it's starting to change. The people who are listening to this show, I was just reading some of the reviews that you guys send uh, and that you guys post on iTunes. And the conversion that you guys are making, either from uh, classical neoconservative conservatism, or or even some people moving from constitutionalism, a constitutional conservative, to libertarian. And I, Darren was even mentioning he was talking. He came in this morning and said he had two people when I went to church on Sunday, who said, "Hey, we've been came out of me out of the blue." Said, "Hey, we've been listening to the show. I thought I was a conservative my whole life, but after listening to your show, I really think I'm probably a libertarian." And I didn't really understand what that whole libertarian thing was. Because for so long, the message has been so radical and, and really so ridiculous as to make it unappealing to the vast majority of people. Did you guys watch Stossel and his coverage of the, or his, he, he did a live taping at Students for Liberty. And I didn't, I didn't go into the Students for Liberty thing because of my rule against standing in lines. And unfortunately, there was a line to get into the John Stossel thing. And I said, well, forget that. And But they did this taping, and I watched it last night with my wife. And they brought on a libertarian from this libertarian think tank. And I don't remember what his name was. But his solution to solving the messaging crisis that, the liber that libertarians are having is just simply to concede on certain issues. For example, to concede on uh, some sort of welfare state. And he said, for example, even Milton Friedman who we've discussed on this show and who is largely what we would consider a, 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 a utilitarian libertarian, meaning he saw that he's a functional libertarian, not really a principled libertarian. Um, and don't get, the, don't get me wrong on that. Again, that's getting in, 
Forget everything I just said about that because that's just going to confuse everybody. But he said even Milton Friedman agreed in some sort of like safety net for the poorest among us. And he said, so we, you know, we kind of need to give up on this idea of eliminating a welfare state on coming out and saying taxation is theft. And I, the most the good the good thing was was even John Stossel was like, so your answer is that we in a sense capitulate, that we sell out. I said, no, I'm not saying sell out. I'm just saying not hold the same opinions that make us libertarians. And oh, that was essentially I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Okay, yeah, that's the, yeah. of course he didn't come out and say that. And, and I get what he's saying. It, he recognizes, and this is the problem. It, it, so many people can identify where a problem exists. Very few understand what caused the problem and what the appropriate solution is. And I'm just, I, I've been invited to speak. Um, actually, no, no, well, speaking is part of it, but uh, I, I've got, gotten a call from the Pennsylvania uh, Libertarian Party who's going to be holding their, their, uh, their event on the weekend of the 19th. And there will be a presidential debate there, and they have asked me to come out and, and emcee that event. And I don't know if I should be telling you this, but I'll tell you guys anyway, because I, 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 they have officially asked me to come. Um, there is some question they would also like me to stream the event, and we are trying to work out whether or not we can do that. Um, but depending on whether or not that happens, I believe that I am probably going to go there and uh, be the moderate, not the moderator for that event. They've got a couple of people to ask questions, but I'll be, I guess I'm going to be the Anderson Cooper standing on the stage, kind of wrangling the contestants, so to speak. And they're going to have most of the major players. I don't think Austin Peterson is going to be there, but they will have John McAfee. Uh, Johnson will be there. Um, uh, Mark Allen Feldman will be there as well as several others. I believe Daryl Perry will be there as well. And so you're going to have essentially the same setup that we had the other night, minus Austin Peterson. I'm trying to convince Steve Kerbell to go, uh, because I think that if we do it and he shows up there, he's he's going to have a, a prime opportunity, especially if we get the chance to stream it. But They've also given me an opportunity, they said, to speak if I wanted to. Now, I don't really care about that, but if they want me to speak, I, I will. But I, I was thinking about what I would even talk about. And I don't want to give away kind of what I want to cover, but I just see so much opportunity here in this year. Not to win anything, because I think that's utterly ridiculous. Let's live in reality. But in order to show people a third way. Because isn't it cool? How, I don't know if it's happening to you, but it's happening to me in a big way. I had my, uh, someone, uh, I've had several people since the magazine was released and my, and my wife was posting pictures of it, uh, start reading about my background and what we're doing and, and knowing that I'm involved in politics now and, and kind of discussing it. We're seeing so many people come online Facebook, Twitter, wherever, in our, in our daily communications who are saying things like, I, I just, I mean, I don't like any of these guys. Is, is there any other option here other than these guys that we see, other than a, a Bernie Sanders or a Donald Trump or a Marco Rubio or a Ted Cruz? I mean, is there anybody else? And we're saying, yeah, let me tell you a story. You see, the, everybody loves stories. So you got to find a way to craft your message into a story, but we've got this we've got this golden opportunity to show people, hey, there is actually a third option and here's why it's important. Here's why it's important that you don't just sit at home, that even if you know that the third party isn't going to win that you go and you cast your vote. And we have this golden opportunity to do that now in a way that we haven't had in in my lifetime. There is so much dissatisfaction, so much anger that it's boiling over. And I am very excited, not necessarily about this election, but about what we're going to see if we do it right over the next six to eight months. And I'm really, really proud at people like Mississippi, guys at like, Pencil, uh, like the Libertarian Group in Pennsylvania, who are trying to compete 
with quali- with the quality and, and and the ability of of mainstream media. You see, prices are coming down on stuff. I mean, you used to not be able to stream an event unless you were a network. And even if you could stream it, it wasn't very good quality. It was really mediocre, kind of a kind of a PBS quality of show. But now, man, with what we've got with the technology that we have, we've got an opportunity here to to compete. To put it out. And so as, as I start to as I start to know more information about what's going to be happening, because I know they're going to stream it. The question is, can can we afford to bring all of our equipment out to to assist them in that or not? But they are going to be streaming. And I've offered to at a very at the bare minimum to simulcast the stream at Liberty One. And so as we get closer to the date, I'll be announcing the times and all of that type of stuff to keep you informed on what's happening and when so that you can begin to uh, so you can make plans to listen. And what I think would be a really cool idea, people have already started talking about it as it relates to the, the, the Fox News debate, is having a debate party, inviting some people over and saying, hey, we're going to I remember when when I first got married, we did that. We had debate parties where we got a bunch of our other friends together and we watched the debates together and kind of discussed politics. I think it would be really cool if people would do that with a libertarian debate. And since we now can stream over the internet and to Roku, we've got a huge opportunity for people to simply plug into their computers, plug their computers into their televisions, and boom, we're up there in HD. It's a chance for for you to show the message and to talk about it with your friends, whether they be libertarian or not, and just say, hey, there's a third way. And it'll be interesting, as I said, to see how things go forward. But rolling back around to this North Korean situation, um, it begs the question. I had a question the other day from one of the listeners who said, uh, he said, I, I get pro-peace, non-intervention. I understand all that. He said, what I can't get is, when is it okay? I mean, can we, can, we not, can we not ever do anything? And I said, no, but you bring up a very interesting point, is that it's not a black and white line, despite what anybody will tell you. It's just not black and white. You see, if someone comes up to you and they say, hey, Jason, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punch you in the mouth, and then they raise their fists up as if they're going to punch me in the mouth, naturally, I don't have to wait for them to punch me or to take a swing at me before I defend myself. At some point in that exchange, a reasonable person would assume that what this, what this individual has told me is going to happen, they are preparing to do, and they have the means and the ability to do. And I have the right to defend myself. Well, we look at something like North Korea and we say, well, at what point is it okay to initiate action against the North Koreans. What, do we have to wait for them to shoot a nuke at us before we retaliate? Do we have to watch part of California be reduced to dust before we have the right to initiate action? I have to believe no. The answer to that question is no, you don't have to wait. But it's always this, it's this very thin line We say, okay, he's standing in front of me. He's telling me he's going to hit me. He's raising his hands up like he's going to hit me. Is he really going to hit me? Has he done this before to other people? What has been the outcome? There's a totality of circumstances that one must consider when trying to determine when we act in self-defense. What we find in many cases is that the anger toward us has to do with some sort of other foreign policy intervention that we're engaged in, some sort of other violation of the five principles that led to a point where someone is standing in front of us telling us they're going to hit us, right? And so we have to be very careful in in looking at the situation. For example, 
one of the things that North Korea is very upset about is a new round of sanctions that have been put on them. Now, we've talked about sanctions in the past, the danger of sanctions, right? Where goods cross borders, armies do not. But because of North Korea's nuclear testing, which is in violation of sanctions that were already put on North Korea, they've now tightened those sanctions down. North Koreans, of course, not happy about this. And now you've got military operations and training exercises going on in South Korea, joint exercises between the North Koreans and the Americans. And, South Koreans and the Americans. I'm sorry, South Koreans and the Americans. Yeah, with the South Koreans and the Americans. And the North Koreans are looking that, at that and saying, uh, well, yeah, we're, we're preparing to launch nuclear weapons. If you want to have these exercises that are always geared towards how we combat North Korea, if you want to have these exercises, then we're going to threaten nuclear war against you. It's not the first time this has happened. Before they had the nuclear weapons, it was an invasion strikes. The idea now is just simply that things have gotten worse with the fact that North Korea has these nuclear weapons. But in, you, I don't have the answer for you on this. This is, this is the point I want to make to you. I can't tell you now is the time, now is not the time. What I'm telling you is when you look at the totality of the circumstances, this is something that North Korea does quite frequently. They bow up, they flex their muscles. This is in response to a foreign policy decision by the United States and the international community to, again, limit trade. And it would seem prudent to me that if we want to reduce our chances of being annihilated or at least part of the country being hit with nuclear weapons, or at least the threat of that being real, one of the things that we might do is try and open up diplomatic relations. Now, I know that's a crazy idea. Kind of like it's a super crazy idea to open up diplomatic relations with Cuba. But think about what might happen if we did that. People might begin to see all of the interesting goods and services that come from America. News might start to leak into North Korea about what's happening in the U.S. and around the world. Maybe not. But it certainly couldn't hurt, could it? Having the opportunity to trade with another country, whether we agree with them and how they conduct themselves or not, doesn't that give us the opportunity to influence their nation in a positive way? Doesn't it weaken their leaders to some respect? If the people inside of that country begin to see what free market capitalism can do for them, it's what happened in China. As the opportunities in China began to open up and unfold and people began to get wealthier, the government continued to expand slowly but surely because their people demanded it. And as wealth and prosperity began to come and people began to come off of the farms into the factories, similar to what happened in the 19, early 1900s in America when we had our industrial revolution. People started clamoring for more and more freedom. Most recently, we've seen riots in the streets by young people in China advocating for freer elections, the ability to choose who would, be, who would stand as their elected official rather than allowing the government to dictate to them who their choices were. North Korea is a terrible dictatorship run by evil men. Wouldn't opening up free trade to that country have a significant and positive impact? And even if you say, well, it might not help, it might not create that, but it certainly wouldn't hurt, would it? Just some stuff to chew on. If I go a little bit deeper in the stack, I hadn't planned on getting to this until much later in the show, but it just seems prudent at this point. The White House and Cuba are maneuvering over Obama's visit. Obama has tried and is succeeding in opening up diplomatic relations and trade with Cuba, something that is long overdue. And, and uh, Obama should get a massive amount of credit for this because it's something that should have happened a long time ago. Sanctions obviously didn't work. All it did was impoverish the people of Cuba. 
We're now establishing embassies, and it is a tense relationship. The Cubans don't like us. Their dictators don't like us. But we're willing to open up our borders for trade. How incredible is that? And now, a Major League, Major League Baseball is looking at having an exhibition game in Havana during President Obama's planned visit. How cool is that? Sports! Bringing people in, allowing them to compete with one another, allowing them to meet each other. These are the types of things that we need to have if we want to have a freer and more peaceful society. We don't need war games. We don't need sanctions. We just need trade and cooperation. We don't have to agree with what those countries do, but the way that you change that is not by saying, look at how evil they are. Let's punish them and punish their country and punish their dictators until they do what we want. That just causes those dictators to tighten their grip. The easiest way to create and foster change is to show people the power of capitalism to show people what freedom can do for their country. And oftentimes this is a process that can take generations as you begin, as a young generation begins to grow up to see the fruits of capitalism, the fruits of free markets, and the fruits of liberty in their countries. Right? Are you following with me? It's so important that we trade the battlefield and sanctions for free trade and sportsmanship. If we do that, we can, we can do incredible things. I'm telling you, there is, there is no, um, no dictator that can survive an economy backed by capitalism. Eventually, it gets taken down. All we have to do is leave the door open, but too many times our elected politicians in an attempt to uh, appear strong, and to appear in, in opposition to such an evil and oppressive dictator, the first thing that they want to do is clamp down on trade. It's the very worst thing that we can do if we truly want to ignite change in that country.